I'm going to do a presentation, show a couple of videos, and lead a discussion. But the first, what I want to do is to tell you a little bit about the Truth and Democracy Coalition, and then about some of our upcoming events. So the Truth and Democracy Coalition was formed to build a pro-democracy movement in America. We educate the public about disinformation, teach people to be critical of the propaganda they consume, provide critical analysis of current events and social issues. We produce media and educational materials, hold seminars and meetings, work with other organizations, and organize events and activities geared towards building a pro-democracy movement in America. The coalition seeks to build communities of people of different faiths and ideologies to defend and promote democracy locally, nationally, and globally. We will have our second nonpartisan Red Pills men's group. And so what we do at that group is we talk about women, relationships, politics, and life. And at our second meeting, we're going to begin our book study of the book, The, the Rational Male by Rolo Tomasi. And we will begin with the first section of the book, The Basics. So to register, go to tinyurl.com slash redpillmen. And then on July 16th, 2023 here at 2 p.m., we will have the first of a series of planning committee meetings for our January 6th Remembrance, Remembrance event. We are planning our annual event to remember the attempted coup and insurrection against the United States Congress. It's important to remember what happened and not let the horrendous actions of then President Donald Trump and his extremist followers work to overthrow our government and install Donald Trump as dictator for life. In order to resist authoritarianism in America, we, we have to keep the events of January 6, 2021 at the forefront of people's minds as we head into the 2024 elections with Donald Trump still the front runner for the Republican nomination. So we're going to be organizing an event, an event in Whittier, and we will help others organize events in their hometowns. So join us on July 16th at 2 p.m. by registering at tinyurl.com slash Jan 6, 2024. And then finally, be sure to check out our YouTube page at youtube.com slash at truth and democracy coalition and be sure to like share and subscribe so i'm going to lead a discussion about what's wrong with men and what to do about it as a survivor of severe sexual abuse i'm going to tell my story address the problems facing men today and talk about what we need to do to help men so in this type of discussion, it's difficult to draw a line on what one should and shouldn't say. And a number of the issues are difficult to talk about. I don't want to name names or identify people, and I'm not, certainly not telling you everything. I'm only going to talk about things that are relevant to our discussion about men's loneliness and despair. I will try to find the right balance. And I beg your patience with me and with one another as we grapple with this difficult subject. Okay, so now what I'd like to do is i like to show you some of that data. Here we have the share of men who are, are share people 25 to 35 years old. And this is a graph of the unmarried and whether they've had sex in the last year. And we see that there's been like a 20% increase since around 2009, 2008. Yet for women, it's laid largely the same. And then down here, these are the married couples. And we see here that almost zero I mean, there's a points where women are almost at zero. And then here's this increasing gap. 
And I don't know what to make of it. Probably, I know that men, when they're cheating, probably still have sex with their wives, while women, when they're cheating, they tend not to have sex with their husbands. And so I, it makes me question, who is the person who's really most likely to cheat in the relationship? And I think it's the person who has more opportunity to do so. And, and that person is usually the woman. And then here's a graph that sort of shows you a picture of what hypergamy looks like. And on the left, we see this is the men who would happily marry um, the women they would happily marry. And on the right is showing women and the men that they would be happily partnered with. And there's one thing I want to tell you that this on the left, this red part, this tells you what men really are. This tells you what men really are. They're not toxic. You know, they're not dogs. You know, they're not trash. They're not useless. You know, men are God's gift to women. No matter how old or young, heavy or thin, beautiful or ugly, there's a man who will make love to you. Men are God's gift to women. Over for women, not so much. And what this sort of also shows, and the next slide will show, is that men have a much broader sexual palette than women do. Women have a more narrow sexual palette. For men, there's a niche for every type of woman out there. And here, what this reminds me of is I tell young men in high school and so forth that the girls they're hanging out with now, when they graduate, they're going to start swinging for the fences. And that that's sort of what that reminds me of. Even the least attractive women um, feel entitled to the most attractive men. And why not? Here, what we see is, this is from OkCupid, okay and this is a rating of how men rate women and how women rate men. And we see that men have this bell curve here. That, and they come up with some type of range, but they, they come up, they, they find most women attractive. Women, on the other hand, look at the least attractive side. It's 50% of men are unattractive to women. If you add the 23%, that's 75% of men are on the unattractive side of the graph. And then you look at most attractive, 0%. Women have a much more discriminating sexual palette and a more objective standard. They're all looking for the same thing. Um, muscular, good genetic markers, muscular, um, good chin cut, um, and then um, finances, um, protection, ability, um, and status. So, and men have more of a subjective standard. Some men like one thing, other men like other things. It's a little more subjective for men. For for men, they're all for women. They're all looking for the same thing. It's an objective standard. And so, what does this tell you when women say it's not all about looks? You know, we get this thing that oh, men are all about looks. It's all about beauty. They never see the inside. Uh, yeah, for men, it is about looks, but they have a wide palette. They they find a lot of women to be attractive. It is about looks, but they find many women fit into um, their mold for what is attractive. But for women, what they say when they say it's not all about looks is that, hey, it's mostly about looks, but you can add in status, you can add in uh, financial, or the provisioning, you might add in some protection there. But primarily, but it's a lot about looks for women. And so um, 
this myth that somehow men are all about looks and women are more about the less um, physical side of things is absolutely not the case, at least according to the data that we're, we're, we have. Okay, so women have had this great opportunity to be sort of sexual liberation. They are having um, sex with the men that they choose to have sex with. Um, and it's not necessarily that women are necessarily more sexual, but they have much more sexual opportunity. And so um, they have this new liberation. The taboos have gone down. Sex for the sake of having sex is okay nowadays. Um, women are much more free to have sexual relationships with, with men and much more sexually, they have it in a sexual revolution of sorts. So what have women chosen to do with this new sexual freedom? So this is from Tinder and this shows um, the amount of men and women who like and then match with a person. And we see here, men like most women. Men are attracted to most women. Um, but women, 95% of the men on Tinder. Now, this may be weighted more towards the sexual marketplace because it's Tinder. But some say it's maybe it's around 20% of men if we put the whole population in. So women are only liking and matching with 5% of the men. And then look over here, look at only 1% of the men on Tinder are getting all the action. And this is great for those men, you know, and for the women, but it's not so great for, for the rest, 95% of the men. And then these men, these men who are the 1%, they're just like other men. They have a wide sexual palette. They'll have sex with you, whether you're fat, tall, skin, dumpy, beautiful, whatever. So for women, why not? These men will have sex with you too. It doesn't matter necessarily what you look like. They're men. So why not just have sex with the most sexiest, hottest men? So... What this says is that really dating has become very, very difficult. This is a graph that I caught my attention because I'm older and I'm looking at it and I'm saying this myth that somehow um, women are just as sexual as men. And I mean, they can be during their ovul ovulation phases, uh, but it, men are on all the time. Testosterone keys us up all the time for sex. Whereas women, it just goes along with their ovulation and their phases. And so here, what we see here, um, this says men are single adults who are not in a committed relationship and are not looking for one or for casual dates. 62% um, of women are not looking. And it's almost the opposite for men. 61% are looking. Um, and then for me, looking at the among the ages of 40 plus women, 40 plus, 71% are not looking. Now, I don't know if this means that they're not having sex. Obviously, they could be having sex. There's a lot of opportunity with strip clubs and, and male strippers and, and stuff like that. Um, it says casual dates. I don't know if it means sex, but women retire. You know, some people say men are looking for love. Women are running a business. They're looking for a guy to pay the bills. And so women retire from the market. So what this tells me is that maybe men have to date younger women. I mean, we get this but, oh, men like to date younger women. It's so disgusting. It's terrible. But maybe they have to because that's the state of the marketplace. And then what about the young women who date older men? Where's the anger at them? What's more disgusting, an old man dating a young woman or a young woman dating an old man for status or money? You know, so 
And then the need for prostitution. If women drop out of the market and only really want to have sex with the hottest and most muscular and most masculine men, then there's a need for prostitution. But really, prostitution is such a poor substitute for true affection and companionship. And a lot of men won't be able to afford it. So they're going to be out of the, the market entirely. So and it says here, nearly half of the U.S. population of adults say that dating has gotten harder for people over the last few years. Here, women are making bank off of men's loneliness and despair. It serves women that men live in sexual scarcity. This is OnlyFans or what we often like to call Only Fools. And if you don't know, it's kind of like a cam girl set. But men need sexual affection. Men need that connection. And they're willing to pay to get it. They need that, that connection and affection and intimacy that they're not getting and they're willing to pay big money to get it. So, and there are so many scams out there and this is a scam and that women are making very exploitative of, of men in many ways in which they're, you can't go on a dating site and not end up with emails from women trying to get you to go to their web page. You, you can't. You get hit up by um, women who want to move to America or other women on Facebook or whatever trying to make contact with you and then asking you for money or, or women on even dating sites um, hitting you up for money or catfishing you or something like that. Here's... Um, the medium, the income of married men versus married women and single women and single men. And we see married men make tons of more money. And that's the main difference between married men and single men is the amount of money they earn. And I guess right now I'm coming to a point in the presentation where, you know, if you really want equality, because men will always make more money than women. Because that's what women demand. Women demand that men make more money than they do. So men will always drive further, take more dangerous jobs, work longer hours to make more money than women. Because they're required to do that. That's what women demand of them. So if you if you only if you turn a marriage market into a business where you're only where you're um only marrying men who make more money than you, then you'll always work for the man. And that's just, I don't know, maybe it could pan out some way where um, a, a richer and richer women are marrying richer and richer men. But if you're only going to marry men who make more money than you, you're always going to be working for the man. Now, here's another way of looking at it. This is spousal income um, versus a woman's own income and the age in which they got married. And it benefits women to marry young. And right now we're seeing a lot of women who have, are fooling around in their 20s. And then all of a sudden in the 30s, they're finding, oh, I've got to get married. I want to have children. And they're having children. There's some indication, an article came out that said, 30% of women will be alone and childless by 2030. So, and there's also some that say um, men are leaving the dating market, but I haven't really found the numbers for that. This is sexual taboo fantasies. And, you know, there's nothing more conflicted the people are no more conflicted than they are with their sexuality. What we think we are, who we believe we are or should be, our moral values, are often not in line with our sexual desires. But here in the pink are the women, female 
dominated this more interest and the blue is more or purple is more the male and we see again here men all over the place almost everything all sorts of weird stuff some of it is is horrible but men have a wide sexual palette but let's look at what women are interested in you know spanking female submitting male dominating heavy bondage asphyxiation choking rape play masochism sadism cutting and piercing women there's a theme and it's all about male domination and violence there's something about violence and domination that is sexually stimulating for women and there's you know there's also a lot of reliving trauma in our sexuality as well and these things maybe have been ingrained in us from a neolithic age and really what we have is a neolithic sexuality um i'm not and that's just a statement of fact not a or a Neanderthal type of sexuality. But here we we can see that if if women really want equality, if they if they're opposed to male domination and they want to end male domination, maybe they should stop pining for it in the bedroom. I mean it, it's this is so conflicted. We're so conflicted with our sexualities, but it's it makes sense. I don't know if it's possible. I know a lot of the people, uh, the evolutionary psychologists, don't think women are capable of change. But there was a time when people used to take their families as entertainment to watch someone be drawn and quartered, which I think means being torn apart by the ho a horse, to watch someone being tortured. We have been able to increase our sensibilities. And even just not long ago, there are things on TV and programs that we couldn't say today that, that we would find offensive. And the further back you go, the more you find it. So there can be an increase in our sensibilities. Hybristophilia, an attraction to extremely violent criminals or a person who has committed a gruesome crime. Now, only women really have this fetish. Men are not writing letters to female murderesses in jail. Only women do that. As I said, there's something about violence and the potential for violence um, that is a turn on. And so it, it really makes me think if you really think men are toxic or you really want to oppose toxic toxic masculinity then maybe it's a good idea to stop being attracted stop breeding with criminals or stop going after bad boys and stop you know that might make a little sense um really masculinity is what you're attracted to it's not toxic or but if there is toxicity and i'm thinking about this is it toxicity between, is it femininity that's toxic or masculinity that's more toxic? And given my experience and the data, I think there's enough toxicity to go around. It's good to be back in Vilnius, a nation and a region that knows better than anyone the transformational power of freedom. And a nation which stands today as a stronghold of liberty and opportunity. A proud member of the European Union and of NATO. <laughs> NATO is stronger, more energized, and yes, more united than ever in its history. Indeed, more vital to our shared future. It didn't happen by accident. It wasn't inevitable. When Putin and his craven lust for land and power unleashed his brutal war on Ukraine, he was betting NATO would break apart. He was betting NATO would break. He thought our unity would shatter at the first testing. He thought Democratic leaders would be weak, but he thought wrong. 
I mean that. Our commitment to Ukraine will not weaken. We will stand for liberty and freedom today, tomorrow, and for as long as it takes. Putin still wrongly believes that he can outlast Ukraine. He can't believe it's their land, their country, and their future. And even after all this time, Putin still doubts our staying power. He's still making a bad bet that the conviction and the unity among the United States and our allies and partners will break down. He still doesn't understand that our commitment, our values, our freedom is something he can never, never, ever, ever walk away from. It's who we are. I mean, it's who we are. It's who we are. The defense of freedom is not the work of a day or a year. It's the calling of our lifetime, of all time. We are steel for the struggle ahead. Our unity will not falter, I promise you.